everyone, thanks for tuning in. I'm Casey Bryant, and this is the Hat City Hockey Show. And welcome to what I guess can be called the season finale. The 2020-2021 season is in the books for the FPHL, and the Columbus River Dragons have taken home the Ignite Cup. Not the Commissioner's Cup, the Ignite Cup. As in, any season played without the Danbury Hattricks should just be ignited into flames. It isn't even worth mentioning. The NAHL Junior Hattricks fell short of the Robertson Cup playoffs, but they have sent a whopping 16 players and counting to NCAA rosters for next season, which, that's pretty impressive. So all that's left are the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs, which, if you hadn't realized those had started yet, LOL, the Edmonton Oilers have already been swept out of the first round. Best two players in the world, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, thanks for coming. When even Stephen A. Smith is calling you out on ESPN, you know you've colossally messed up. Connor McDavid, the phenom, the future of the sport, the NHL's leading scorer, Dreisaitl, second in scoring to McDavid this year. Swept in the first round as the higher seed? I would give anything to be Stephen A. Smith's personal hockey advisor intern. Just to help him prepare for his next tirade and tangent about the NHL. You thought his Kwame Brown rant was good? Just wait till you hear my thoughts on Brett Howden. Before we get going with our guest, we want to give a quick shout out to our featured charity of the week, the Danbury Animal Welfare Society. The Hattricks have partnered with them in the past. They do tremendous work caring for local animals, so head to Dawes.org to find out how you can donate, volunteer your time, or just find a pet to love. Now animals are very near and dear to the heart of our guest here today, and if we're going to wrap up the 2020-2021 season, we might as well do it with a bang. The legendary Doc Emmerich is here. <laughs> My next guest on the Hat City Hockey Show needs no introduction. He is simply... Doc. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Doc Emmerich. Doc. Yeah, I was I, I was sort of hard pressed as to what to wear. Uh, I've got this. I've got the flags in the background, which is a port here on team that no longer exists. Right. Um, Barry Soskin gave me a uh, a Commissioner's Cup sweatshirt to wear I, the night they presented the, the last port here on championship team with their rings. That's right. Uh, I had it up there and I thought, well, no, that's probably not going to wear too well with a Danbury crowd. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so I stuck with an NBC logo thing and uh, and and uh, put the Port Huron and the uh, Fort Wayne, which is now in the ECHL. And uh, I didn't know what to do. So anyway, <laughs> uh, hopefully your uh, hopefully your audience will understand. Ordinarily, I begin these interviews by asking my guest what they've been doing over the last calendar year to keep sane, which takes on a whole new definition for you, because in the last calendar year, you've called the Stanley Cup from home. You've retired. You released a book, gone on hundreds of shows to promote said book. You seem like the busiest retired guy in the United States. So I ask you, <laughs> what is it that you've been reading, watching, listening to in your spare time that has kept you going over the last year? Well, I've been watching a lot of hockey. And, you know, um, I, I think probably um, because of what you just mentioned, that pretty well took care of mid-October to mid-December. And then we started uh, the regular season in the NHL, anyway, in mid-January. And there were some other teams to watch in the developmental leagues, and some, uh, of course, um, sadly, like Danbury, weren't able to participate because of COVID and the regulations within their states and being able to assemble teams, and, and that was really sad. So I've been able to follow uh, development leagues pretty well. We did have our team in Port Huron. They finished fourth. Uh, so unfortunately they didn't qualify for the playoffs and congratulations to the river dragons for winning the championship. Uh, you know, I, I know that one of the real characters of the league is Ahmed Mafus and, and, uh, we had him in Port Huron and he sure scored a lot of goals for us here. And I know he led to a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, unusual colorful incidents, uh, as player oh, yeah. coach. Uh, he probably should have been wearing number seven for Reg Dunlop, uh, as colorful a player coach as he's turned out to be in that circuit. Uh, but I know uh, Elmira put forth a pretty good effort before it was all done. But uh, during the course of our time here, as a matter of fact, just two days ago, now you and I are talking um, on this podcast on the 24th. 
Uh, the Prowlers announced that Matt Graham will be their general manager and coach right. as Joe Pace Jr. has now decided to, for personal reasons, to back away. And Joe Pace Jr. and Joe Pace Sr. are both very colorful people in their own right, and they've been a part of this Port Huron franchise here for some time, too. Uh, but uh, among the other things that I've been able to do is uh, my wife and I are both fans of animals, and we watch veterinary shows sometimes. And other nights, while I have watching uh, hockey, she will have uh, Dr. Pole or the Alaskan doctor or one of those on to watch uh, how they're tending to creatures. Uh, we're both fans of uh, public television and also NPR. And so we will be watching some of the shows there. There was just um, Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic Passage, I believe it was called. Uh, I should know the title of it. Just finished on in on uh, public television last night. We uh, we watched that series too, and I've been able to read some, but not a lot because it's been somewhat busy. So I'll have a better grasp of retirement probably after the playoffs in the NHL are over in mid July. How's that for a real concise? answer <laughs> oh please our fans will love that you even know the federal league exists honestly it even gets a shout out in your autobiography off mic how a kid from basketball crazy indiana became america's nhl voice yeah, yeah shout out the carolina thunderbirds for their commissioner's cup in 2019 uh i love that book i i've read that over the winter and i especially love the first time that you fell in love with the sport namely the romanticized pugilism of the international <laughs> hockey league uh, I think that story rings true for a lot of Danbury fans who grew up either with the Federal League or with the Danbury Trashers of, of infamy, uh, or even the New Haven Nighthawks across the state of Connecticut. So I ask you, as someone who is so devoted to these development leagues, and you mentioned two of their better characters in Ahmed Mafuz and Joe Pace, why do we like this cacophonous, absurd world of minor league sports? Well, I think in almost any sport, Having a hero-villain relationship is not a bad thing. I mean, as much as we in the NHL think that we really are beyond that, um, even though Tom Wilson was in a handshake line um, going out in five games to the Bruins, we were curious as to how he would be uh in the hench and and he was just fine and the bruins seemed to be just fine with him because he was one of the villains and and uh in washington they thought that brad marshan was one of them and we still have that not nearly as much as we did in the 1970s when boston won a couple of championships with tough players as well as skilled ones and philadelphia did but I still hear from Con Madigan, that great old tough guy that Fort Wayne had that I enjoyed watching in, uh, in the 1960s, and he's still the oldest NHL rookie at 38, having played for the St. Louis Blues. Uh, there's something about that element in our sport that I think appeals to people, especially at the grassroots level in the development leagues. I, d I don't know that that's ever going to leave at least at that level. Now, our uh, fighting in the NHL is not nearly as prominent as it once was. Uh, Wes McCauley, the referee, his father, John, and I did a, a two-year series of telecasts on PRISM television in Philadelphia called You're the Ref. And he would tell me about the 1960s and 70s during which he refereed. And he said, we would empty the benches almost every night. Well, that doesn't, of course, happen. That was outlawed in 1988. Uh, but the, the spontaneous fighting, even in the NHL, is still tolerated because at some t there are times when it can change the course of a hockey game. And old John Ferguson, um, now passed, who was one of the legendary fighters, and then later a general manager in the NHL said the same thing. It can still change the course of a game. But uh, as a part of entertainment, I think we still feel that even though the, the uh, ridiculous kinds of fights that happen just because the game is seven to one and they're going to send a message for next time, that's kind of crazy and it's been outlawed or, or at least heavily pen uh, penalized in the NHL. Uh, those, uh, those are one thing, but the ones that are done to pay back a score, uh, that sort of makes you feel like, uh, yeah, the hero villain relationship and the fact that the morality play is being settled. Uh, there's something satisfying to fans about that. And being a fan, 
I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned a lot of the great heroes and villains over the course of that book. You mentioned a lot of the great enforcers in minor pro hockey from the greats like Dave the Hammer Schultz to uh, Frank Never Beaten. Uh, if Danbury fans will remember Frank the Animal by a Lois. They sound like WWE nicknames and they are just fantastic. Do you have a favorite enforcer name and what would yours be? Oh, I have no idea what mine would be. And I, I, <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, one of the favorite people that I've known all through uh, my time in hockey, and he's, he is mentioned in the book, and he's probably has a recollection to some of the older fans who saw games uh, in New Haven, either as a home player or as a visitor, would be Archie Henderson, uh, because he rolled up a lot of penalty minutes, mostly in the minors. But he did make a statement, I think, for his Capitals when he played some in Washington, because in all their years, they had never beaten the Philadelphia Flyers in six or seven years at the Spectrum. And uh, the first time that they called Archie up from Hershey, uh, he took on uh, the tough guy, Ben Wilson, for the Flyers twice. And uh, they, I believe the final score was six to nothing that night that the Washington went into Philadelphia and beat the very powerful Flyers. And that was the very first game that he ever played in the NHL. And it was also the first time that Washington had won a game in Philadelphia. They won quite a few since, including eliminating the Flyers in a playoff series. But sometimes, uh, as the late John Ferguson said, it can change the course of a game. So he was one of my favorites because, as you have found out, there is oftentimes a real great contrast in these guys who realize that that is their role, uh, but the type of people they are. And I really feel that hockey people are as good a souls as you're ever going to find. I mean, the, the, your owner is one of them. I mean, Colton Moore is a good soul, but he's also a guy that uh, had the enforcer role for an, for a number of years too. And um, so that that's, that's one of the dichotomies, I think, that when you sit in the stands, you think that the, the guy on the other team that does that is, is an evil varlet. And, <laughs> and then you get to know him and it's different. Uh, when we had the Maine Mariners uh, developed in, in Portland, Maine in the American League, it, uh, we were fortunate uh, to win the championship the first two years. And uh, the president, the original president of the team, Gil Stein, who later became general counsel of the NHL said, all it takes to love a Mariner, and there was no one elsewhere in the NHL that loved the Mariners because they were a tough team. All it takes to love a Mariner is to know one. And so very much like you, we would take the team out to service clubs as often as we could and get the public to shake hands with them and to actually, so that they were not saying, we're going down to watch the Mariners play they would say, we're going down to see Brian Burke and his team, or Mike Busnick and his team, or Dennis Patterson and his team, or Frank Bathe and his team. We're going down to see Frank play tonight. And so that was how it happens in developmental league cities, and it's still done that way to this day. Now, we were in the heart of Bruins country. We were in northern New England in Portland, Maine, and um, a guy came up to us at the Cape Elizabeth Lions Club after one of our sessions. I don't know if Brian Burke was one of the speakers. He was a very good speaker even then. But uh, he came to us, and, and uh, I, I don't do a Maine accent too well, but he said, you know, we don't cotton very much to raising baby flyers up here <laughs> uh, because it was Bruins territory, and uh, they didn't like the fact that the Flyers had just won a couple of Stanley Cubs. But, uh, the Bruins had just won a couple as well. And being in the minor leagues as a broadcaster like you and, and rising through the ranks, it, it can make for some madcap circumstances. You highlight one in your book where a coach is running across the neutral zone at one point in a game, <laughs> what would you, which is just perfect. Uh, what would you say is the craziest setup that you had for a game growing up? Well, um, you know, do a, a, trying to broadcast a wedding uh, because we had – in Des Moines, um, they, they advised me that the intermission was going to be 10 minutes longer because of a wedding that was going to take place at Center Ice uh, between the president of the Des Moines Capitals fan club and one of the members. And I said, okay, so I, I was able to reach the groom be, you know, before the game 
and uh, did a short interview with him, which was forgettable because he was nervous and I was too. What do you ask a groom, right? Uh, that uh, before a wedding that's going to take place in the middle of a hockey arena after the first period of a game. Um, and, and then um, we had a five minute newscast. And so the wedding was going to take place immediately. So I stayed on. And then the five minute newscast was going to be after the wedding and then it would come back to me and it'd be time for the, for the start of the second period. Out comes one mat along the red line, a short one, and the minister and the groom come out on that one. And then out from the other, from the end boards comes a real long mat, about a hundred feet long, and the bride comes down that. And the, our team was Port Curon and, and the flags. And uh, so they go to their dressing room and the Des Moines players including uh, Philadelphia Flyers current radio color commentator, Steve Coates was one of the players on the Des Moines Capitals. They are asked to remain out. Uh, and you as well as I, and many of the fans know how hockey equipment smells after it's been perspired into, which is understandable after one period of hockey. So anyway, these players are asked to stand on either side of this mat and form two lines and hold their hockey sticks up uh, to create an arch and it is underneath this arch of hockey sticks that this young lady is supposed to uh, walk out to center ice to the strains uh, played by the organ of the wedding march. And so she does, and I'm sure it doesn't smell like a church. She comes out to center ice and there's a very uh, uh, hasty ceremony that is performed and rings are exchanged and kisses are planted and then they lock arms and they go back down this, this uh, arch of hockey sticks. And at that time there was, um, there was a, a, a custom in the Midwest of throwing rice at weddings, uh, but they didn't have rice, but they had a lot of other things that they could throw over the, over the screens. There was no glass there over the screens to salute the couple, which they did. Uh, but there was a lot that was thrown over. And so they had to detach the nets to use them as rakes to scoop all this debris up, which was ankle deep. And it took 45 minutes to do that. And so the five minute newscast could not be extended any longer, I guess, because it wasn't done. And so I had, I was working alone as you often do. And so uh, it was called Guts Broadcasting. I had a long, long fill that night in Des Moines, but we won the game. And so <laughs> I all guess that matters, was, right? <laughs> I guess it was okay. Yeah. Now the real question is, are they still married? <laughs> I, I don't know that. You know, I honestly, before we, because uh, the story's in the book, before we put the book to press, we tried to, you know, do all the Googling and everything we possibly could with, with the groom's name to, uh, to trace it down and see if we could even talk to them. But um, even though the PR guy who spoke with me that morning, I know he's living in Fort Wayne now. He moved back to the Midwest from uh, further in the Midwest from Des Moines. Uh, I am in contact with him, but he has no idea. And we weren't able to trace down anything in the, in the uh, public records in Des Moines, Iowa to locate them. <laughs> now, it, you've left your mark all across the Midwest, as you have the, the hockey landscape, but all across the Midwest, you, you've left a legacy of sorts. So what do you consider a better feather in the cap in your career? The Mike Emmerich booth in McMoran Arena out in Port Huron, or your last name being part of WBKE in Manchester? Oh my goodness, yeah. Uh, both were sort of accidental. The, uh, the, the FCC back at that time in, in the late 60s required five call letters uh, to be sets of call letters to be submitted uh, for the new FM station on the campus of what is now Manchester University in North Central Indiana. And the advisor uh, to our station had come up with four that incorporated the, uh, the initials of the college. And he was stuck for a fifth set. And so he took the last name initials of Brent Barkman, Dave Kistler, and Mike Emmerich, the last three station managers, and put those in and then sent it in. Well, of course, you knew the the last set was the one that they chose uh, being the federal government as it was back then. So that was an accident and um, some well-meaning people here in Port Huron decided to uh, name the press box after me about, oh, 15 years ago, I guess. And that was a very kind thing they did. It was uh, unveiled before a game between Port Huron and Fort Wayne which was uh, Fort Wayne is still the team, the only team I openly cheer for in hockey. And um, 
uh, Port Huron was the first team that paid me to do games, uh, 160 a week, and I negotiated a tough, tough salary. It was the most money I ever had. I called the uh, the coach at Bowling Green, Jack Vivian, who recently passed away just a couple of months ago. Uh, I called him to tell him that I had made it into pro hockey because I'd been at Bowling Green with him for the last two years. And he said, great, what are you making? And I told him, and he said, you're working for nothing. And his wife grabbed the phone and said, ask him how much he made in his first coaching job. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we all start out rather humbly, but uh, that is to be encouragement to you. Uh, just keep plugging away and don't quit. Yep, yep, we all start from somewhere. And over the course of your career, you've accumulated many accolades and keepsakes in your career. I've heard you say that you have an entire storage unit filled with scorecards and programs and credentials and, and whatnot from throughout your career. And you've joked that you can't take it with you, obviously, but if you could take one thing with you from throughout your hockey career, what would you cling to? What is your favorite keepsake? Gee, I, I don't know if there'd be anything tangible. Um... Uh, I am glad there is a heaven, uh, and I don't want to wax too seriously here. I'm glad there's a heaven. And people that uh, I admire theologically say that not only do humans go there, but also creatures. Uh, I, I really hope that's true because I have had love affairs with not only my wife of 42 years, but with a lot of pets. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I hope I hope that's the case. I don't have anything in particular. You know, it's funny, I'm just uh, sitting here and uh, uh, this year, uh, Kraft Hockeyville uh, was going to be the uh, El Paso, Texas. Yeah. And I have this sitting out on the table because we were gonna talk about it during the Stanley Cup final last fall. This is an old puck that I have from the El Paso Buzzards. <laughs> Can you see? I don't know if you can read that. Yeah, uh, they are. They are not in business anymore. But uh, in their league. Boy, what was it? Southern Southern League or Southwest Hockey League back when they they won a championship. Uh, anyway, they uh, someone down there sent me all the pucks of uh, of the. Uh, teams in the league. So I kept this out because I was going to show it sometime late in the Stanley Cup playoffs because that was where uh, Kraft Hockeyville was going to play a game. I think that got postponed. I'm not sure. I shouldn't speak authoritatively about it, even though I have my NBC uh, <laughs> thing. I'm not sure what, what has happened to that game, but I'm sure the people in El Paso know. Sure. Yeah. They played in the Western Pro League. And oh, there you are. See? Yeah. There you go. I, and they I had, knew they had I... those crazy zigzag jerseys. <laughs> so, uh, as a jersey nerd, that those always stick. In mind. <laughs> and now they have the rhinos in the North American League. So El Paso is oh. still hockey strong. Uh, Very good. Speaking of jerseys, and I may know the answer based on what's behind you, what is your favorite logo slash jersey in hockey, and why is it the Fort Wayne Spaceman? <laughs> oh, they, uh, yeah, uh, that's because the first team I ever saw play and the one I still cheer for wore yeah. that. And spacemen in the 1950s were novel because we hadn't, we hadn't uh, <laughs> launched, we hadn't launched rockets into space. We didn't have the man on the moon or anything like that in the 50s when the, when the team came to Fort Wayne. And, and uh, I don't know if it was a, uh, if it was a misspelling intentionally or not, but the K in Comets, unlike Utica, is spelled with a K instead of a C. That's why the K is on the front of the Smiling Spaceman. And then they went to the Ball of Flame uh, in the 1960s um, later on, and they've uh, been able to maintain that most of the years um, of their franchise history. And they're coming up on, what would it be, 70? Yeah, 70 years, because they were 1952. So they'd be coming up on 70 years this next fall. But I'll tell you some of the jerseys I really like. I like the skating bear in Hershey. Uh, they had, I don't think they wear that um, maybe for special events, but they haven't worn it in quite some time. I like the green eyes of the Chicago wolf. Mm. You know, the, the wolf with the, with the tongue. You know, I, I like the green eyes of the Chicago Wolves jersey. And there, there are a lot of others that I really like. But those are two that, that uh, stand out for me. And this jersey behind me is, um, is the Port Huron Flags. And originally, 
they had one that was declared illegal because they used the American flag. It's a border town. Mm. Port Huron and Sarnia, Ontario. They are joined by a bridge at the mouth of Lake Huron. And they used the Canadian flag on a hockey stick crossed with the American flag on a hockey stick. And they were very quickly advised by both governments that you cannot use that in a commercial venture. And I'm sure the owner of the team who hired me for 160 a week uh, said, I lose money every year. This is not a commercial venture. But uh, anyway, they changed it to where they had uh, the eagle with the stars and the, uh, a different kind of leaf. And I admire what you have done with the five stars paying tribute to the history of Danbury hockey by, yeah. by uh, including all five stars for the five different team names that you've had there. That's a wonderful gesture to embrace the past, but also live in the present and, and plan for the future. So you, you've done a wonderful gesture there because people remember the original Trashers and all of those other teams that have come through Danbury. Uh, but they admire you, I think, for embracing the past, but, uh, but moving on with your own team. Yeah, our branding is great here. And I wish I could take credit for, for drawing the logo, but I'm not that talented artistically. Uh, our last game here in 2020, our last pro game with a crowd, was a banner unveiling for a lot of the team's past. So we retired the number of Corey Fulton, who was a longtime uh, minor league enforcer. We raised a Danbury Trashers 2006 division championship banner, one for every team, a Danbury Whalers Commissioner's Cup banner. Uh, that's, you know, it's, it's still very rich in our history here in Danbury. We, we greatly appreciate those that have come before and, and we're always looking forward to what's coming next. Uh, before I let you go here, Doc, I, I'd love to rattle through a couple of, of James Lipton-esque lightning round questions for you. I try never to curse. So don't give me the one that he always asked about my favorite curse word because I try not to. Well, I'll adapt it. For anyway, you. go go ahead. I'll okay. adapt it for you. What is your favorite? Dad password? gummit. <laughs> what? what is your favorite password? Password? Yes, the, a word that you use to describe a pass. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, wow. Favorite one. Um, I, I've got a favorite word for a shot because it pertains to uh, a couple of players uh, that are now either coaches or retired. Rick Tockett, when he played in Philadelphia, would bring the stick back about as far as he could, almost to his waist from the other side, and then follow through. And I used to refer to his shot as hatcheted mm -hmm. because it looked like as somebody that was drawing back as far as they possibly could. And it had that effect, kind of like a guy drawing back a hatchet. Uh, but past, I don't know. Uh, I don't, I, it certainly isn't ladled or anything like that. It's, uh, it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I would do terribly with James Lipton. That's for sure. Okay. <laughs> I'll try another one. Maybe I can be more concise. Sure. What hockey sound or noise do you love? The bodies hitting the boards and glass. Hmm. That's a good one. That's a good one. Is there a hockey sound or noise that you hate? Pounding on the glass by fans. <laughs> so one even though I bring the board, sure. that's fine. The other one, that's not fine. Yeah, yeah. Even though it probably feels good to them to do it, it just confuses the issue. Uh, I like them to behave themselves and yell, but not pound on the glass. Gotcha, gotcha. Now you've already lived out a lot of people's fantasy of getting to sit down with Gretzky and Orr and Lemieux, Crosby and Taves for your famous uh, interview with, the, with them. And, and you, if you pick any one of them, you've got someone's favorite dinner guest that they would yeah. have on their short list. A non-hockey dinner guest list for you, if you could pick four people, who would you pick? Um, I, I'd, Ben Franklin. Mm. Uh, and I would basically just sit and listen to him and I would probably need another good listener to be with Ben because Ben would, would probably, first of all, uh, he would stop once in a while because all the pictures I've seen of Ben gave me the idea that he ate pretty well. That's so true. he would probably have to stop and eat. Uh, I would imagine he would want turkey because he wanted that to be the national bird, did he not? He did. I think, yeah. Uh, I think Clarence Campbell would probably be a good listener. Uh, when Clarence Campbell called you in for a hearing, 
he would hand write your testimony. This was told to me by one of the Detroit general managers way back in the 1970s. And so you would sit in his office in Montreal and he would say, okay, what is your side of this? And then you would start to talk and he would stop you in mid sentence and he would be handwriting in longhand. And they say, okay, go ahead. And then you would continue and he would handwrite your testimony in longhand, even though there were stenographers back then and there were typists, that's how he would do it. So I would think he would be interesting not only to talk about the early years of the NHL, uh, when he got a chance to speak, uh, but also uh, also for that reason, uh, I think uh, FDR would be interesting because of what I just watched last night, a man who start, actually started his fourth term uh, from the standpoint of, of politics and from an athlete's standpoint and maybe an athlete that might have been mistreated, Jim Thorpe. Oh. So those would be my four because he, he played baseball. He was a wonderful track and field athlete. He played football. He had, his, he had his medals taken away because they thought that because he played a little for the New York Giants that, uh, that he was a professional. And he was honored by the king of, uh, uh, the king of Sweden, I believe it was, um, and in Stockholm at the Olympics and all of that. So those, those would be my four. Um, and I would probably have it at Hurley's in New York because Paul Barbet is the owner and a great Rangers fan. And I'm sure he'd have some suggestions for Clarence when we got to dessert about how he could have helped the Rangers during some of those years. <laughs> so that would be it. Wow. I love it. I love it. Some <laughs> great choices in there. Uh, being paired with Chico Resch may give you some extra insight into this. Favorite arena food? Oh, that's an easy one. The hot dogs in Montreal. First at the Forum. Yeah, first at the Forum and then at uh, Bell Center. And where we worked at Bell Center, um, Chico loved the hot dogs. He would not only, gosh, I'm telling tales on him, but I guess the statute of limitations has run out. Uh, he would he would have the press room meal, but then he would start on the hot dogs and you weren't allowed to bring food out of the press room into the broadcast area where we worked, but somehow or other he got it smuggled there. And in our games in Montreal, he would keep uh, we would keep a tally of how many hot dogs he would have. Now, it was hot dogs, not hot dogs and buns, because what he would do is put two hot dogs in one bun. And so technically, I think the record was after a press room full meal. He had 12 one night during the game, but that only amounted to six buns. So I'm not sure how the Canadian method of scoring is whether that counts as six or whether it counts as 12. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> oh, but I would have them double up on the wiener. So there was two, but one night with Madison square garden, my friend, Larry Gaines, who's the uh, video guy secretly was taping me and I ate, I ate somewhere between five and 10. Oh, I won't you? tell you how many closer to 10. They just uh, so anyway finally doc last one uh when you do eventually get to the pearly gates and god hope it's a long time from that day we don't know but yes thank you uh, god willing what would you like god to say to you when you reach the pearly gates uh well done that's all any of us can hope for uh because um i believe god gives us all talents to use and lou lamorello used to use this analogy and you you said earlier uh, someone who designed the logo that's not a talent that i have but you have other talents and you've shown it here in this last half hour and everyone uh he used the analogy of a symphony and he used to talk about everyone that worked in the devils and now i'm sure he uses the same analogy for the islanders everyone who works in the office and everyone who works on the scouting staff has a specific talent and whether they're the tuba player or the violinist or whatever it is, they all work together to make certain music. And I think uh, God gives everyone, regardless of the limitations that they have a certain ability. And I, I just hope that I get a well done. That's what I hope. Um, that's what we try for, isn't it? Yes.
Yes, and I'm sure this symphonic metaphor hits home for you because I know you're an avid clarinet player growing up. <laughs> yes, yeah, that uh, clarinet's been in the case for about 40 years now. The last time was some summer in a polka band that was in a parade in Wabash, Indiana. That was a long time ago. <laughs> Break out a little Benny Goodman, why not? Yeah. <laughs> Well, Doc, this has been an extreme pleasure, and I thank you so much. You know, you write in your book that you still haven't found the appropriate words to describe what the pursuit of a Stanley Cup feels like in your soul beyond chasing a ring. And, and I want to leave you with a passage from, from one of my favorite books, Bear Town by Frederick Backman, because I feel like it may ring true, but we'll see. Uh, Frederick Backman writes, Hockey is just a silly little game, and we devote year after year after year to it without ever really hoping to get anything in return. We burn, bleed, and cry fully aware the most this game can give us in the very best scenario is just a few isolated moments of transcendence. But what the hell else is life made of? I find that, about be, that? I find that to be extremely poignant. It's one of my favorite books. Uh, and, you know, I thought of it as soon as I read that passage in your book. And, uh, you know, just from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for sitting down. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. This has been wonderful. Go Danbury, and uh, good luck to Binghamton uh, coming in new. And uh, I, I have a lot of memories of going to see the Broom Dusters play against the Old Main Mariners a long time ago. That's been a great hockey town, too, and you'll enjoy going there, I know. And, uh, and good luck to Colton Orr and to your staff as you start another year and you actually get a year in. So we'll hope for that. Thanks again. That'll do it for us here on the Hat City Hockey Show. If you liked that episode, be sure to click like and subscribe. Ten shows in the books. Thank you so much for tuning in and for being part of the Hat Tricks family. And stay tuned for more awesome things coming to this channel in the near future. I'm Casey Bryant. Take care.